Hello everyone, welcome to my couch talk uh, for RailsConf 2020. My name is Vladimir and I'm going to talk about monoliths and microservices, actually not microservices, but what lies between monoliths and microservices. So let's start with monoliths. Rails is monolithic by design. We have everything included in every new Rails application. API tools, background jobs, web sockets, front-end utilities, even even rich text editors. Monolith is not a curse. It's an architectural pattern, and it could be very efficient pattern. We know that uh, there are great Rails monoliths or majestic monoliths, which are very successful. Unfortunately, majestic monoliths are like black swans. We know they exist, but we don't see them very often. A typical Rails application is doomed to become a monolithic monster. And the question is how to prevent this, how to keep our application maintainable as, the, as it grows, how to make developers happy to work with it. What should we do without monolith? Uh, one may suggest, uh, well, maybe we should just split it into microservices. That should, should sell, sell, solve all our problems. Uh, that was a hype train regarding this, hopefully starting to derail. Now we know that microservices usually end up uh, becoming a distributed monolith, which is just the same monster and even harder to struggle with. And uh, the problem why monoliths, all distributed monoliths, become a mess is that we forget about the core principle of this separation. We need to split our application to logical, logical independent units, into components. And components connected together, together with, with a, some kind of bus still uh, live without, uh, still live within a monolith, and, uh, but make this monolith loosely coupled. That means that uh, if one component is broken, it doesn't affect others, and that's fixing it or refactoring it is much easier. Unlike with monoliths, if there is a bug, uh, and it usually could be hard to fix it and s or slow or painful, and uh, we cannot guarantee that this bug won't reappear in the next version. So we're going to talk about component-based monoliths or modular monoliths. One particular example of such monolith is Shopify. Uh, they had a great article uh, describing the architecture and uh, we can take a quick look at the structure so they have components with some uh, gem like structure inside the application and uh, that's great uh, but the problem with shopify approach we cannot apply it to our application because their tooling hasn't been open sourced yet but we can still borrow the idea, and that's what we're going to do during this talk. Let's talk, take a look at other examples. Uh, Hanami framework, another Ruby framework, is also allows you to use component-based architecture. They call themselves monolith thirst, which means that uh, you can start with a single component, but if you need, you can add other components later as your application grows. Another example is uh, Umbrella projects in Elixir. Actually, they rooted back to Erlang, uh, but that's the same idea. You have multiple uh, logical applications working as a as a single system, as a one process, as you can tell it. And uh, in Rails, we actually also have this idea, and it's called engines, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's take a quick detour and talk about myself a little bit, uh, how I ended up here uh, talking about component-based architecture in Rails. So you can find me on GitHub under the name Palkan. You probably know about it. Let's uh, talk about what I'm working on. So I'm, called, I'm working on a company called Eva Martians. Uh, we've been working remotely for more than 10 years, and now we have bases in, around the world with agents scattered in different continents. Uh, so we are everywhere. Resistance is futile. And um, you probably heard about our open source projects um, and from the Ruby world, front end world, and uh, development tools. And also, we have a beautiful blog with uh, 
a lot of technical buffs. But today I'm not talking about open source. So I'm talking about the dark side of my everyday life, uh, working on commercial projects. And uh, about half of our clients use Rails as the core technology. And today I want to share one particular case study. So that's a story of twin projects called Common and Kin. And uh, that's where we started actively use component-based architecture where this approach evolved and formed some guidelines which we use today in other applications. Let's take a quick overview of what uh, these services are and why we decided to use this kind of architecture for them. So common. It's all started with this service. It's a long-term uh, co-living rental service uh, working in big cities in the US and Canada. Uh, before we joined their team, uh, they only had a management application for management properties, leases, billing stuff, and so on. So not user-facing application. And our task was to build a community portal for users. And uh, one of the requirements was that we needed to do this within the same Rails app. We, they didn't want to, and that was the right decision, to have uh, microservices or services right away because most of the logic was uh, implemented in this Rails monolith. And that's actually when this monolith started to become a monster. It could become a monster if we didn't do the right thing. So what is a community portal? So it's a mix of, uh, let's say, meetup.com and chat platform and some other smaller stuff. So as you can see, the features are almost independent on each other. And uh, even on the logical level, they have a well-defined boundaries. So that's why from the day one, we started to use namespaces to kind of isolate uh, the lexical and structural level, uh, all the code related to a particular feature, a particular domain. So namespaces, oh, actually we don't have namespaces in Ruby, so that's just modules containing all the code. It's a very easy and fast way of doing this fake component-based architecture. Why fake? Because you cannot guarantee that a code from one namespace doesn't access the code from a different space, which should be avoided. That was pretty much for the MVP, it's a very initial version. But then the requirements evolved. Uh, it's, it was clear that we are not going, we are, we're going to build some kind of spin-off projects, another community portals for different uh, applications, but with a very similar functionality, and uh, it looked like we can reuse, we could reuse most of the features code, this isolate, isolated code, but we needed a way to make it truly isolated and also portable. That's when we started to use engines and project gems. So that's our final architecture uh, structure of the project. I'm going to talk about it in details in a few minutes. Uh, one of the key points uh, which made us to make this decision was this article, Module Monolith Rails Architecture. This is really good starting point to learn about component-based architecture in Rails and to know what kind of initial problems you might uh, encounter while doing this. It turned out that there are much more <laughs> pitfalls, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So technical deals, how to make engines work great in a component-based system. So as I already mentioned, we used engines and also local gems, as we called it. So gems live through just in this application. And so like a monorepo without publishing anywhere. And we called this both uh, concepts in a single world called engines. So that's the name. Let's start with the engine. What is the Rails engine? Let's like a short answer is just something you can generate running Rails plugin new. Uh, but uh, let's dig a bit deeper. We need to know what engine is before 
going into details. So first of all, engine is a gem. So you can build it and publish like any, any other gem. It has a gem specification, which lists uh, the requirements, dependent, the required dependencies, and uh, the lib folder with all the code. Uh, secondly, what makes engine a bit different from the typical gem is that uh, some rail specific entities, it has your app folder with controllers, models, uh, whatever. And uh, the idea is that when you add engine to a Rails application, these entities are available to the auto loading mechanism. So you can just use this constant without require them. Uh, engines also have their own test suites, so you can and should test them in isolation. And uh, engine also come with an engine class in the namespace, which acts like a glue between a Rails application and this particular engine functionality. You can add initializers there, configuration, and all other stuff like in a Rails application. And uh, finally, uh, you can add roads to the engine and use these roads later in your main application by mounting them in the core app roads RB. So, have you ever seen engines in wildlife? Of course you did. And uh, this is just the most popular engines. That's part of the Rails application. So, Rails actually has a component-based architecture. That some of the components are engines, full-featured engines. Others are realities, but we're not going to talk about today. So, if we're going to talk about outside, outside Rails world, the most popular engine, of course, is device. If you ever use device uh, or extended its controllers, used uh, paths and uh, roads or whatever, so you used engines. So use engines and you'll be happy and you can build a component-based application and that's it. That could be the end of this talk. But uh, likely for me, so I can talk about it here, uh, the process of engineification of applications is not that straightforward. Uh, realizing what engine is is just the very beginning of the process. It hides a lot of complexities, problems, or whatever that you will likely face if you're not aware of them. That's just a map of all the kind of situations we had and the solutions we found to deal with uh, engines in a component-based Rails architecture. I'm not going to cover all of them today, but just the most interesting of them. So let's start uh, discussing the architecture of the app we had. Well, that's just a few pictures of what was the final result. So we had a engines folder with a few engines, gems folder again with some and uh, gems. Uh, the application roads are be consisted only from consists only of uh, mount directives uh, and uh, our, our gem file we had this uh, gem definitions with which pointed to our local engines so we're using just path option of the gem uh, the application diagram as like a components diagram could be seen like this so if you can see uh, the feature related engines, which implement some business logic, uh, have the similar names uh, with a by suffix. That's just a convention we use in all the projects, so where engines are named uh, with some kind of verb or mostly usually verb or noun and uh, some suffix. So the connect by was the name of our core engine, which consists, contained um, basic models like user, uh, building, whatever, and some base entities. And f there are another layer which used connect by as a dependency, as a meet by, chat by, and perk by, perks by, uh, all feature engines. 
And we also had two utility engines for active storage proxy and common events we're going to talk about it later. And finally, one umbrella engine with admin UI implementation. Uh, so because admin UI use uh, data from all of the engines. That's one of the ways of doing this. We're not going to talk about alternatives, but that's how we implemented it. So let's start investigating our map. And our first stop is uh, dependencies management. So that's actually the first problem you're going to encounter, I think, uh, when using engines. There's a number of questions. Uh, when you're starting to extract functionality in isolated gems. Let's consider them one by one. First problem is occurred when you have some non-Ruby gems dependencies. It is dependencies loaded from GitHub, uh, from local sources, from any other Git repositories or whatever. Uh, you cannot specify them in the gem spec, which is used by gem command for the gem file. So you have to duplicate this definition in your root gem file. And that makes it harder to maintain and synchronize dependencies. It's, it's really easy to forget to port some dependency from one place to another and end up in some problems in production. So we found, a, a, in my opinion, an elegant way of solving this problem. Uh, evolve gem file. That's a built-in functionality into Bundler which allows you to just uh, kind of uh, include another gem file into the gem file. And uh, the final idea was that every engine, and except, except from the gem spec, has also a gem file runtime um, gem file, which consists of non Ruby gems dependencies required in runtime and also a usual gem file with depend, uh, development dependencies. This way we can make sure that our dependencies are synchronized. Uh, another problem is how to share uh, common dependencies between engines without duplication as well. Uh, so the approach is pretty much similar. We have shared gem files in the gem files folder. For example, to synchronize Rails version between engines and the main app, we use a gem file. And, uh, then in engines gem files or root gem file, we just do the same evolve gem file trick. Uh, uh, okay, so we know how to specify versions, but we also have lock files, and we would like uh, the versions of the root application and engines be the same. Uh, why so? First of all, because we run test installation. Does means that we want to use the same versions. There is a gem called transdeps, which uh, acts like a guard, which prevents you from having different versions in your root gem file and engine gem file. You can try to use it if you want, but uh, well, to be honest, uh, we didn't care about this problem in the very beginning. Yeah, we were just, okay. We had some system specs coverage uh, that was good enough for us. But then I saw this jam and, said, and tried to run it and check whether we are consistent. And it turned out that not. We're not really. But actually, if you take a look closer look at this uh, list of inconsistencies, you can find that uh, about half of them are related to development and uh, test dependencies, uh, which we do not care about. So we only should care about production dependencies. And another portion of this is just a patch version differences, which is also pretty safe uh, to not care about patch version differences. Anyway, we started thinking about a better way of keeping versions in sync. And we ended up uh, with this idea. So instead of uh, having uh, separate lock files for engines and the main application, we started to use a root lock file for everyone by using a root gem file for all the engines. So this idea kind of simple, but has its own limitations or actually problems which we had to solve. What about engines development and test dependencies? Uh, we don't want to add them to the root gem file into the def default bundle group because they will be loaded in production and we don't want this. Uh, 
another problem is kind of vice versa. Uh, when we test engines, we use Demi Rails apps, which to bundle require for the test environment and the default environment. And that could cause loading everything, all the application for testing a single engine. And that means that we do not have real isolation. So we had to solve these problems. And we solved it by adding a helper method to the bundler DSL. So it could be used in the gem file called component. And the idea of this method uh, is the following. First part of it uh, just uh, repeats something we just discussed. So it's just adding a gem and its runtime gem file. And another portion of it is a bit more interesting. Uh, it allows us to add this gem development dependencies to the main gem file under this specific named group, named by the name of this gem. So it won't be loaded in production or even in development or test for the main app. Uh, we do this by parsing the gem spec and extracting development dependencies from it. Uh, why we use a named bundle group? So that's actually about the second problem. Do not load everything in the dummy apps. So that's how a dummy, default dummy application for the engine looks like. It has this bundler require Rails groups, which just load all the gems specified in your gem file with a default and the current end group. Instead of it, we use a name group named by this engine. This way we load only this and only the dependencies related to this gem from the main gem file. And thus, we avoid uh, leaking other engines uh, dependencies into this particular engine. So we save solve the problem of isolation this way. Uh, to avoid specifying bundle gem file environment variable, there is a simple tip. You can use a local bundle configuration and specify it for a particular uh, gem or engine. Uh, so let's go further. And the next step in our journey is database. What's interesting about database and engines? There are two questions. Uh, well, first of all, we may have migrations in our engines. And we need a way to use these migrations in the main app. And also, we might have uh, Cs in our engines. So it also would be great to use them as main app, right? So let's take a look at these uh, two problems quickly. First, uh, migrations. Uh, standard way of dealing with migrations in engines, usually meant for external engines, which you third party engines like device, is installing migrations into the main app. Installing is just actually mean copying them into the main apps migrations uh, directory. Uh, but when we work in the component-based architecture, we do not want to extract this uh, component somewhere else. We just keep the code base together. And uh, we prefer to not copy the migrations, but make the main app use these migrations as their own migrations. So to mount migrations into the main app, that requires just tweaking with two parameters of the Rails migration system. First is the path to look for migrations and uh, for the whole application. And the second, which is surprisingly is a different configuration for checking the pending migrations. We also need to specify that we have this uh, additional part, path to look for migrations. That's it. And for seeds, that's pretty simple. Uh, engine already have a method called load seed, which loads db uh, crb file from your engine and you can use it from your main app. Uh, let's talk about the next question. So we already mentioned that engines are tested in isolation. Uh, how? How exactly is it uh, happening? So when you call Rails plugin new, Rails will generate a dummy Rails app for you to use in tests, which is just a very simple, it's kind of a uh, slim Rails application, but still contis cons containing a lot of stuff you don't need, like, you know, every result of Rails new command, right? So hopefully there is a better alternative and it's called combustion. That's the gem, which makes uh, using dummy applications in your gems very simple, as simple as writing a few lines of code instead of 
having a full feature structure. Uh, if you want to add some specific files, which are not could not be uh, implement uh, described in the configuration, you can just uh, add only them without all their boilerplate, which is generated by Rails new. So with combustion, you limit the application to the frameworks you need. They're explicitly specified. You don't need boilerplate, and the good news is migrations are managed for you. They will run for every test run. And uh, another testing related question is uh, how to run engines test or CI. So on one hand, this kind of com uh, architecture makes uh, CI configuration a bit more complex because you have to run a separate test for each engine. On the other hand, uh, we can skip tests uh, for engines we haven't been changed in this pull request, for example. So if something hasn't changed, we do not need to run tests for that. If actually not changed, that's not the right word. The right word would be dirty, dirty, which means that uh, the engine code, the engine's code was changed, or any other engines which this engine depends on was changed. And to make this uh, decision, so to figure out whether the engine is dirty or not, we wrote a simple script which. Uh, go through the whole list of all engines and gems, load their specifications, build an inverted index tree, and check whether something for this gem or its dependency was changed. Yeah, this kind of maybe sounds a bit creepy, but we, we, I'm going to show you a link to the, all the source codes in the end of the talk, so don't worry. That's just an algorithm. And then on CI, you call this script, and if it returns uh, zero code, uh, you go and run tests, and if it runs one, you just exit. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, more code related stuff and configuration related stuff. So, the, an, another problem with engines is that in one day you would like to. Uh, somehow access an entity from one engine in another or from the main app in the engine or vice versa or extend some entity like for example model uh, or a very another typical example how to extend the engine's application controller or base controller so how to deal with uh, different engine entities and we came up with the idea called base and behavior so it's like convention which helps us to make Rails engines, entities within engines flexible. Let's take a look at the example. Uh, so suppose that we have our application controller, one of our engines. So application controller is a base controller for all controllers from this engine. And then um, this controller has the following uh, structure. First, we inherit it from the some configurable controller which is configured outside of the engine's code could be configured outside from the engine's code usually it defaults to application controller and uh, we can change it to anything we want then we have uh, these checks uh, which like a something like interface so we can define requirements if you use our, if your application controller does not include this behavior, it's just a module, and, and does not implement this method, we raise an exception. So that's kind of a contract. If you want to use this engine and want to specify an application controller for it, this application controller must provide some functionality. That's how it looks in the application code. So we have a custom application controller which include this behavior, uh, which include another model implementing current uh, user methods, and also it includes some application related stuff. So usually, so this uh, is used to add instrumentation, error capturing, and uh, other stuff not related to the logic, but some uh, auxiliary stuff, and. Uh, 
That's how we make it configurable from the main app. And engine's code shouldn't care about all these additions. It just needs uh, this behavior and this method to be defined. Another use case, extending models. A very common situation in when you went, want to add associations to the existing model from the other engine. Uh, we usually do this using concerns, and the question is how to load these concerns. Uh, for that, we use active support load hooks. So every model from every engine implement a load hook. So when this model is loaded, uh, the hook is called, and you can subscribe to this hook, for example, the initializer, and include your extension, your concern to work. That makes uh, these extensions work correctly with auto loading and reloading. Uh, let's talk about another related question, how to communicate between engines. So, so far we're talking about how to modify code from one engine in another. What about runtime communication? Uh, let's consider an example again. So this scenario, very common scenario, every time a new user registers, registers uh, in the application, we want them to automatically join the default CT chat. So remember, we had chats, users, all this stuff. And here is the problem. Registration is happening within the connect by engine. And chat by engine depends on it, but connect by doesn't know anything about chats. It shouldn't know anything about chats. So how can we resolve this situation? How should we inform the chat by engine that user has been registered? The answer is, let's use events, a more precisely event-based reliable publish subscribe mechanism. There is a list of tools we considered uh, for the event pass. Hanami events, uh, it actually has nothing with Hanami framework. It could be used separately. Uh, it looks promising, but uh, still very young. You know, so that was the main reason why we didn't choose it. Uh, we haven't considered an dry events and whisper seriously because they're just a simple pap sap implementations with uh, quite opinionated APIs, which we do not like a lot. Uh, so we decided on Rails event store. Rails event store is a powerful framework used in many applications. Uh, and that was our choice. And it's still our choice for today. Um, it's based, it's backed by active record, so events stored in active record and consumed by, could be consumed synchronously, asynchronously, and that has actually many different features from event sourcing uh, world, which we didn't use a lot. Uh, but we decided not to use the store directly, instead we wrap into a custom gem. So let me introduce a new gem called Active Event Store. It's just a wrapper over Rails Event Store for now but it adds some conventions and also, in my opinion, better Rails integration. What we changed is that we uh, added some testing utilities, uh, added some conventions that I already said. But the main reason for wrapping a Rails event store jam into another jam was to make uh, this Rails event store just an adapter for this functionality. So we were thinking about switching to something else in the future. And that's why we decided to add a wrapper. And let's take a look, quick look at how it works. So we define events uh, at the Ruby classes. Uh, so we define attributes, uh, identifiers, which is just the ID of the event. You s publish an event by creating an instance of this class and calling it publish method. And you can subscribe to this events somewhere in the application and start reacting on them. So subscribers could be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, synchronous subscriber called in a background job. You don't have to add a custom class, a job, or whatever for that. You can use the same subscriber in a synchronous and asynchronous manner. And we introduce some convention of naming subscribers. Uh, so you name subscribers using the name of the event uh, as it's shown in this picture. So that's a gem you can use today. 
And the final question to discuss uh, today. So we, we talked about engines, 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 blah, blah, blah. So we've split it application to components. What's left for the main app? Should we keep something there or not? We cannot make the app main app uh, like a zero code because we, even in an extreme case, when we do not have the app folder, and that's what we use sometimes, we still use, use configuration, uh, database stuff, and uh, maybe something in the lib folder, like uh, generators templates or whatever. Uh, that's an ideal case, so you don't need an app folder. It works for applications written from scratch with very well-defined requirements when you know beforehand how to split your logic. Uh, more common case, and actually it's a case from a common service, uh, is when you still have something in your app folder, like base application something stuff, like application controller I already showed before, and even in our case, we have authentication logic in the main app, uh, but that's uh, like a you know, controversial idea and would recommend it for everyone. Uh, what definitely stays in the main app uh, is, first of all, feature or system tests. You should test, uh, you should write integration tests for the system as a whole, not just for separate components. Uh, locals and templates overrides. Your engine shouldn't worry about uh, UI changes and all the non-code specific stuff. Instrumentation exception handling, that's what we already covered. And of course, configuration stuff. Rails configuration, frameworks configuration, and so on. Um, a few words about gems. So our configuration has a code name engines and gems or engines. So we also had gems, local gems. Local gems solve different problems. First of all, it's a better organization of the code not related to the business logic, to the application itself. The code that could be shared between different applications uh, and even be published somewhere in the private or public uh, registry. So that's what we did with Active Event Store. It's actually, originally, it was just a gem within a project, but then we decided to open source it. And uh, of course, it also gives you a benefit of isolated tests, which reduce CI build times and you know, fast tests is what I'm worried about a lot. OK, and that's just an example of typical gems that we have in the projects. Let's uh, share Rubicop configurations with custom cops and uh, plugins. It's uh, RSpec configuration uh, with, again, useful tools and, uh, and so on. And um, applications which use GraphQL, we usually have a common GraphQL uh, local gem with some GraphQL specific tools. All of these uh, local gems eventually, I think, would be open sourced. But for now, we just uh, keep them in the different projects. and. Uh, collect the different features to be combined later in the official public jam. So that was a quick overview of the engines and jams architecture. And if you noticed, we only covered the half of the map I showed, but still, I think you got an idea. And hopefully, I demonstrated some solutions to the problems. So should we use engines or not for your monoliths? Um, there are a lot of benefits. I'm not going to just talking about them. I already talked about this. One of the benefits is that you can extract uh, engines into microservices in the future if you break it up. The problem with engines is that uh, third party gems usually lack support for them, and even Rails is not good uh, with engine support. Here's a link to the uh, resources, scripts, and other useful materials from this talk. Feel free to use it. And thank you. Just don't make your monolith become a monster. <laughs>